in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which happened there on the Mount of Beatitudes, it's in three parts, but part of it was the, was the happy attitudes. And you say, why a poppy? Well, the King James says, consider the lilies, but it's, it's the word actually for poppy. So we use poppy. The other part of the message is that Jesus, and I'm going to use an aggressive word here now on purpose, because I think you'll see this. The other part of the message is Jesus attacks anxiety and anxious thoughts. Right. Attacks it. Yes. Because he knew that the first part, happy are, happy are, happy are, happy are, is not possible if you're filled with anxious thoughts. You can't be happy and be anxious. Now, I know I'm speaking to some people and I'm not discerning this by the Spirit. Just statistically, there are people in this room with anxiety problems. That's likely. More than 50% of Americans are taking some form of medication for anxiousness. This has been called the anxious generation. A lot of things to be anxious about. Number one seems to be anxiety about the future. What does the future hold for me, my family, my nation? Anxiety about the future. So Jesus attacks anxiousness and that's where the title of this talk will come from, Consider the Poppy. Because what you consider, you will conceive. What you see, that's why Jesus often when he was teaching, he would say, see the birds of the air, see the poppies of the field. Well, he wasn't just talking about physically looking at, he was talking about the ability that our brain has to conceptualize when I say see. If I say to you right now, see three big gray elephants, then the way your brain works is you can't help but see that. But there's not an elephant in the room. Well, maybe there is an elephant in the room. <laughs> but you know what I mean. I shared this morning that it's something fresh I learned this week after the book was launched. So we didn't use it in the book. We sure would have. But it was also really encouraging that science is showing that what we researched and found is true. And here's an article that just came out I could recommend to you. I, I wish I remembered the, the name of it. I've got it written down somewhere. A PhD from Southern California that teaches at Fuller uh, and at uh, University of Southern California. They did a study on the brain. And as you know, the brain is left and right hemispheres. And what they learned is, is that the right brain, where your brain handles emotions and feelings, your left brain for reason and creativity and decision making, so forth, what they discovered is, is that every thought, every stimuli that we have comes up through the base of your brain and into the right hemisphere, and this is the language they used. And that's the place that holds happiness or sadness, depression. But it's supposed to be, it's designed to be filled with happiness and joy. And so in the article, the PhDs said, the plan is, is that when a thought, a challenge goes through your right brain, before it goes to the place of reason to decide something, it is baptized in happiness. And as it goes through that hemisphere, then it enters the place of making decision, reason. Oh, I had to shout about that because that's what Jesus' teaching brings out in the book. You get filled with the joy of the Lord, anointed with the oil of gladness, and then you make decisions. Don't make decisions out of your own fears, your own sense of insecurity, your own tank full of bad news. It's too bad, isn't it? The nature of flesh is that bad news sells. Good news doesn't sell. Bad news sells. The more horrible and the more scandalous it is, the more people want to hear it. It's just something in our base nature that we need to be bathed of. It's awful. Lots of us need to cut back on our news intake. 
because it's mostly indoctrination. It's not news. It's not news. It's indoctrinating you. We've gotten to a place where we are so touchy that in churches that are supposed to be filled with this ought to be like this is more important than a meeting of the United Nations. These, this room is filled with ambassadors for the king. And we've become so touchy by the world's bad news and our opinion of it on one side or another that we'll split a church over a pastor misspeaking one word. I know a pastor friend recently that said one thing about some political issue. I wouldn't even call it a misspeak. It was just his opinion, which he has a right to. It wasn't out of line. In the old days, it would have gone, that's, it, would have, it would have made an impression because that's my pastor. Lost 2,000 people in a month. People can't take it. Thin-skinned, shallow, stupid. Amen. Stupid is not dumb. I'm not dealing with a lot of dumb people, but I'm dealing with a lot of stupid people. Stupid is not dumb. Dumb is you just don't have the intellect. Stupid is you know better and you just keep doing it anyway. Amen. That's stupid. Just keep hitting your thumb with the same hammer. That's stupid. That's not dumb. <laughs> Lord, I apologize. No, I'm just kidding. Matthew chapter 6, let's read some of Jesus' words and watch for words like anxious. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. By the way, for those of you taking notes, let me throw something at you that you can study, and I think you'll find it really interesting and helpful. Did you know that in Jesus' teaching in the New Testament, there are three absolute prohibitions of what we're told not to do? All of them happen to start with A, so it's how I remember it. One of them is don't be anxious. One of them is don't be angry. And one of them is don't argue. That's three prohibitions that Jesus taught against. We can't be angry. We can't be anxious. And we can't argue. So some of you wives are poking your husband right now. See there? Look at the birds of the air, verse 26. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? He's talking about anxiousness now. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies, or the poppies, anemone is the word, of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So Jesus identifies anxious thoughts as a lack of faith and says, consider the poppy. What are you worried about? Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Notice verse 33 doesn't say seek to build the biggest church in Seattle. It does say seek first the kingdom of God. If you, if you raise up a group of people this large seeking first the kingdom of God, you will build the greatest church in Seattle. Amen. But our mandate is not to build the greatest church. Our mandate is to build the ever-increasing kingdom. Because here's the deal. A church comes with a pastor. I like him. I don't like him. I agree most of the time. Oh, he's a good guy. Oh, he's kind of old. Oh, he's, uh, whatever. But in the kingdom... You don't have a pastor, ladies and gentlemen. You have a king, and he's in charge. Man, I was a while back, uh, Kathy and I were in Europe, and we went to Germany, and we went to this castle to be given a tour. And we went into a room in this ancient castle. They had beautifully maintained and restored it. And in the room, there was a silo as big as this half of the stage and about that tall, ancient stone. 
In this side of the room, there was a huge vat made of wood slats, massive, like a barrel, but as tall as its ceiling. And so we said to the guide, what is this? And he said, well, this is the room for the storage of the king's portions. That wooden barrel was for his wine, and this was for his grain. And it came from the first small portion of each of his farmers in his kingdom. Because the king didn't grow grain. The king covered, protected, and led them so they could grow grain. And they remembered always to bring him a little bit. So there was never a lack of their king having enough to eat because they all cared for him. Because he's the king. And he didn't grow a vineyard. They brought some of their grapes and supplied him with his wine. Man, that taught me a lesson. I left that room weeping. I thought, my God, I wish every church and every Christian could see that vision, that we have a king and he's never got a need because he uses the blessing he gives all of us to bless the house of God back. There should never be a need in the house of God. Don't let a lack of finance ever be a reason for not doing the will of God. That's nothing. What is that? That's just money. And you'll reach a place where that doesn't even spend. And I'm not talking about an economic collapse. I'm talking about eternity. A hint to the wise. Therefore, verse 34, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's jump into this. The passage, from, this is a sermon by Jesus. This is directly from his mouth. How many times does Jesus address anxiety in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. We read six times. Six times he attacks being anxious. And he identifies it as a lack of faith. When we are anxious, we cannot be happy. So those of you taking notes, I'm gonna give you three false beliefs that happen to us when we are anxious. Number one, we have anxiety when we believe there isn't enough. Please hear that now because some of you are in that place now in your life. There isn't enough money. There isn't enough health. There isn't enough years left. There isn't enough gas in the tank. There isn't enough positions open in the job market. There isn't enough real estate to get a house. There isn't enough, isn't enough, isn't enough. If you start believing there isn't enough, then you lost sight of, consider the poppy. He doesn't work, he doesn't toil, but God cares for him and every need is met. So what side of that do you want to be on? That's what happens when we get anxious. We start to believe there isn't enough. Number two, we have anxiety when we believe that we are all alone. This is a very real feeling. I've been lonely before. Sometimes when you get into a place where you're facing a trial, you can feel really alone. It's one of the reasons that it's so good for you to go to the trouble. And by the way, I want to honor you as the people of God. I mean this sincerely. You had to sacrifice to be here today. I don't know how far you live, but you used some gasoline or some energy. You had to get up a little earlier than you wanted to. It was kind of a rainy day. You could have stayed in bed. Some of you had to get two or three children dressed. Some of you are single parents. All of you paid some kind of a price to be here. I honor you for that, and God is pleased. But you're going to get so enriched by being here because when you're here, the spirit of fellowship is in what is called the body of Christ. The spirit of fellowship, as we interact, somebody sitting right down the chair from you doesn't, may not even say anything specifically to you, but your spirits are communing because the, we're, the spirit of God is in us and we're fellowshipping. Fellowshipping is not just sitting in a circle and talking. Fellowshipping is being in the presence of one another, inviting the anointing of God to come, and then here's what happens. The word fellowship in the original language is koinonia. Koinonia means pouring from vessel to vessel. Pouring, 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 pouring. So what you came in as, you won't leave as because somebody been pouring into you and you've been pouring into somebody. So you're being a blessing and you're being blessed. And all of us are, the Bible says it this way, being transformed from glory to glory, from victory to victory, from faith to faith. So we're all changed a little bit, and it's always good. 
I'm encouraged by being here. Some of you I've known for years. I see familiar faces. Some of you I've never known before because you're new and welcome to this part of the kingdom of God and the body of Christ, and you're in a good place. And I, whatever it is worth, I 110% endorse this house, the leadership of this house, and believe in it with all of my heart, and I'm glad you're here. How many of you, this is the first time that you've ever heard me speak? My God, where's the rest of the church? No, I'm kidding. That's beautiful. Like three-fourths of the hands in here went up. That's awesome. I hope you like me. I hope you tell Pastor Gordon to invite me back. I like you. You're really, it's, you're receiving. Because a teacher, the number one thing a teacher wants, you teachers will know this, is that it be received. You're, you're receptive, and it's, it's beautiful. Let's go to number three, because we know, number two, we're not ever really alone, because he'll be with us always. Number three, we have anxiety when we obsess over the future. This is probably the number one thing cited as a reason for anxiousness in our country, is I'm afraid about the future. I don't know what my future holds for my family. What are my kids going to face? Well, let me give you some good news. This is going to fly in the face of everything you've heard if you've only been tuned into bad news. Isaiah said, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Not of his government and peace, of, his, of the increase of it. When did his kingdom come? Well, the vision Daniel had showed an image, and at the feet of the image it had ten toes. That was clearly the image of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the empire in charge of the world when Jesus was born. The Bible says in the vision Daniel had that in the days of that kingdom, a stone cut without hands smote the image in its feet and it fell to pieces on its face. That was Jesus Christ coming in the flesh as the Son of God dying, resurrecting, ascending back to the Father and interceding for us and sending the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. And that's when world-dominating kingdoms ended in the days of the Roman Empire. That's when the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus came to the earth first. So it's been manifesting here for 2,000 years. Now, we've had some ups and downs. We've lost some time and some ground sometimes because bad doctrine always leads to bad outcomes. One of them I'll touch on is a bad doctrine, in my opinion, is about 200 years ago, a new doctrine was introduced to the Christian church. You can study it, it's called imminent return. But what it means is that there's a rapture of the church that's gonna happen any minute, and those of us who are saved are going to heaven and the rest are all going to hell. And the planet's gonna be destroyed, and it's kind of the late great planet Earth concept. The problem with that is that we checked out on our kingdom responsibility to impact the planet. I was told by my, by my uh, 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 instructors, and I don't want to say peers, what am I saying? Those ahead of me, older than me, don't even finish school. They told me, don't sign up and go to college because Jesus is coming. They said to people, don't buy a house, just rent because Jesus is coming. Don't get married and have children. Jesus is coming. I actually had a man that preached at our church who used to do tours to the Holy Land. Uh, he's in heaven now, uh, Pastor uh, Gregory. And he said to me, I was uh, sitting with him at the house. My dad was a pastor. And he was a pleasant old guy and uh, had a spirit of gluttony. But other than that, he was really a pleasant guy. <laughs> he was sitting there with a big belly like Santa Claus. And he said, Mike, you see that bunch of bananas laying on that table? I could eat the whole bunch right now. I said, well, have at it. He said to me, I was in the 11th grade. He said, why don't you drop out of school? I uh, said, well, well, why would I drop out of school? I got a year left to finish high school. He said, no, you don't need to finish high school. I'm going to Israel for a month. Next month, you can go with me. You'll get more education in a month there than you'll get out of a high school. If you want me to, I'll talk to your dad about it. You don't need to finish school. Jesus is coming. Well, I was in 1967. <laughs> and while I honor his memory, God bless him, I'm so glad I didn't take his ad advice. <laughs> Bad doctrine. 
So, we're anxious about the future. Why? Have you forgotten? Consider the puppy. He's got all this in control. We are destined for a victorious outcome. How does anxiety affect us then? Number one, it distracts us from living in the present moment of joy. I went through, I think in my maybe early 40s, I don't remember exactly, Gordon dares that may have been around then, just starting then because it was in the old building, a dark night of the soul. I didn't know why. Everything was going good. I was healthy. I was young. I was strong. The church was growing. I had lots of friends. Family's great. Marriage is great. And I was just in a dark funk. And my mom and dad, they weren't medicine people. You didn't take medicine. You trusted God. So that's what I was taught to do. So I didn't take any medicine. I didn't go to a doctor and say, give me something to get me out of this funk. I just stayed in a funk. Couldn't pray my way out of it. Couldn't fast my way out of it. Just in a dark night of the soul. Maybe we all pass through those places. Uh, but I was for sure. And um, I didn't understand, well, maybe I understood but couldn't do anything about it, that when you are, when you have like what psychologists call now floating anxiety, which is like I'm just anxious and it's looking for a place to attach itself to give me a reason for being this anxious. I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to attach it to. I did eventually figure it out. That's why I attack the idea of self-righteousness and not depending on the holy record of Jesus as my covering. Because that's what I traced it to. I was as saved as I knew how to be. I was living as good a life as I knew how to live. I was working day and night to please Jesus. I was building a church that I hoped he was pleased with, but I bore lots of personal shame and guilt. Never felt good enough. Never felt worthy enough. Never was perfect enough. You know, it's a horrible thing to be pastoring a church and trying to lead people and not sure half the time you're saved yourself. Like, have these terror, these dreams. Am I, what am I going to do at the judgment? Am I going to be found lost? Do I, God, forgive me for any secret sins or something I forgot about. Don't let me be lost. Just, just torture us. Long about that time when God began to reveal himself to me that he is a covenant God, it was so powerful the transformation that he did in me that then I began to teach it after I had the concept myself and was totally set free. And then we changed the name of the church to Covenant Church because God is a covenant God. And covenant God doesn't make his decisions about you based on your performance. He knew every kind of a mess up you were going to have before you ever thought about it and still loved you. And some of you rascals sitting here today, he knows all about you and still loves you. And Pastor Gordon has given every kind of altar call known to man, and you haven't been up here yet, and he still loves you. And you sit around and talk to the man. I wish, I tell you what, I wish they'd pay this part of the parking lot or something. You hadn't given a dime. And he still loves you. <laughs> I, I'm stepping on toes now. I better get back on the subject here right, right quick. It distracts us from living in the present moment of joy. Can I have an honest moment for me? I'm kind of telling about my life. Sorry to be kind of dumping all this. Any of you feel like you've ever lost any moments of joy in your life because you were in kind of another place where you were fighting something that you may not have even understood? Sure we have. We've lost time. I regret some of those things. I have a serious regret in that because of the place, the dark place I was in. Here I was a pastor, man. You have to do weddings and funerals. That's part of what you do. One of my dearest friends died during that season. I knew he was sick in the hospital and I knew he was serious. And I was in such a funk, I didn't want to be around anybody dying. And that was totally opposite to me. When I first went into ministry, I was a wild man. I believed God could do anything. I used to go down in Houston, Texas. There is a, 
old hospital called Ben Tob. It's the government hospital. It's the free hospital. It's the worst place in town for gunshot and stabbing and car wrecks. And the emergency room is a war zone. I used to go down there when I first started preaching as a single young man. I knew, got to know some of the doctors and nurses down there. God is my witness. This is true. I remember going down there one night on, on, on New Year's Eve when everybody drinks and drives and half kills themselves. And the, 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 uh, the emergency room was so filled with the bleeding and wounded that I was walking around with blood on the floor up over my, the soles of my shoes, mm. laying hands on people. They had people on stretchers all the way down the halls. Mm. I would lay hands on people and pray for people. Could have cared less about the blood. But then when I got in this funk place, I didn't even go to see my best friend who ended up dying without a visit from me. I didn't want to go be a part of somebody dying. I couldn't take it. I failed. I have that to live with now. I, I missed a precious moment that I should have been there, but I wasn't there. Couldn't take it in a hole. Secondly, anxiety distracts us from the presence of God that is at work all around us. That's what you fail to see when you're anxious. You miss that God is working on your behalf all around you. See, I don't believe in accidents, not for the people of God. I told you about that little nurse. My sister is fighting for her life, and you can say a prayer for her. Her name is Jenny. She's two years younger than me. And she's in her second year, miraculously, of pancreatic cancer, but she's not doing well. Without a miracle, she's not going to be here long. I actually had to consider this trip here because I spent a couple hours with her Friday at the hospital, and I told her I was scheduled to come up here. And I said, but I won't go if you think I shouldn't. And I really wanted to come. And she said, oh, no, Mike, don't cancel that. You have to be there. But she smiled. She's been so strong. She smiled and said, listen, if I'm going to heaven, I'm going to call you because i got to talk to you at least before I go. I said, well, you're not going to have to call me. Lord willing, I'm going to be here. And we're not done fighting yet, Jen. We're still believing for a miracle. Absolutely, she said. Because she's gotten miracles all along the way. I don't know where we're at right now, but we're still standing for one. You know, that's what we do, folks. We never quit. We never quit. How, how good would a doctor be if he quit every time he lost a patient and just became cynical? Uh, nobody's going to live. No, a good doctor's going to fight for life. Well, what should we do for, for the fight of faith? We don't quit. Well, here I run into this little nurse who has bought my book and says, I'm going to buy another one because my sister who lost her daughter, 13-year-old, needs it desperately. And it's, this is God that I met you today. I prayed with her. We had a beautiful time. I sent her picture to Amy. And I said to her, you know, accidents like this don't happen. She was crying. So this is so God. I said, accidents like this don't happen. Not when you're kingdom people. The steps of a good man or woman are ordered of the Lord. Man makes his plans, but God directs his steps. <laughs> Number three, when we are anxious, it deceives us into thinking the universe is scarce, depleted, and malevolent. If you believe in a scarcity in the earth and in the universe, then you've been convinced of wrong things by negative media. It's not scarce. God created the earth to be totally replenished, renewed, and sufficient forever. The only thing wrong with the earth is the greedy people in it. The earth is going to be fine if the kingdom of God would rise up as you should. The first mandate God ever gave man was leave this garden, go out in the earth, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue. And you know what happened to Adam. He didn't get started good till he'd messed that up. Did God change his mind? Nope. Go all the way forward to Noah. God floods the whole earth. Noah and the seven more with him come out with all the animals and make a sacrifice. The first thing God says to Noah is the same thing he said to Adam. Noah, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. 
That's always been God's will. So when we get this leaving escapist mentality, we fail in what God has told us to do. How can we miss it when it's so plain? Jesus in uh, uh, Luke 21 in the prayer for unity said, Father, listen to what Jesus prayed. Am I getting too loud? This is the Northwest. You guys don't yell up here, do you? <laughs> Father, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that the world through me may be saved. Amen. No, no, I want to leave. Well, sorry. That's oppositional to the prayer of Jesus. Jesus said, sit your butt down and occupy until you've taken charge of the darkness that rules and establish the kingdom of God. Amen. I'm sorry for saying but. You all made me do that. <laughs> Get me all fired up. How does Jesus remove our anxiety and restore our joy? Consider the poppy. How can we be anxious when we understand that the poppy's done nothing but God keeps it? So Jesus' call to action in this, in this message is this. I'm going to give you a couple of words here that are really important. First, he says, see. See the birds of the field. See the poppies. So here's what we get from that. What we see is what we believe. If you see that the world is bad and getting worse, you don't have a kingdom vision. I'm going to challenge you here. It may step on your toes. I'm going to challenge you a little bit. I'm going to make a statement, and then I think I'm going to back it up with facts. Bad news is telling you the world's worse than it's ever been. I know there's some crazy things going on. The world is better than it's ever been. In the 1820s, there was a gold rush, land grabbing and looking for gold out on the West Coast, south of here, mostly in California, some other states, the United States, and people in it that responded in greed and treachery and died wholesale, and so many of them failed. Many more found nothing than found gold. The United States was in such a dark place then, just 150 years ago. One out of every 39 women in the United States was a prostitute. 33% of every pregnancy was ended in abortion. And they didn't mind if it was full term. In fact, if you wanted a boy and you had a girl, you just killed it. And it was not illegal. There were no hospitals, no doctors, no universities, no real education to speak of. In fact, when Jesus came to the earth and established the beginning of the kingdom, there was none of that. Let me tell you what kind of world it was Jesus was born into. 40% of every human on the planet when Jesus was born was a slave. There was no cure for any disease. There were no doctors what they called a physician, they nicknamed them leeches, and it wasn't because of their prices. It was because they stuck leeches on you to suck the blood out of you because they thought, if I can get rid of the blood, maybe you'll live. As late as George Washington, our first president in this country, that's how he died. They bled him to death. He had pneumonia. They didn't know about pneumonia. Had no cure for pneumonia. So he just kept lit letting blood until the man had nothing left and died. Dark. Did you know there was no organized music until Christianity? There was no orchestra. There was, the greatest music ever written and orchestras that played it was because of Christ's coming. Did you know there were no organized universities? Did you know that there was no paid hospital? Every great hospital that sprung up was sprung up from a church who, who gave to do good. That's why in the most liberal cities in America, there are still Baptist hospitals, Lutheran hospitals, on and on. They came from church roots. Did you know the greatest universities in America were started by churches? The world is better because of Christ's coming and getting better all the time. You say, how can it be? Listen, listen, don't make your judgment based on a microcosm of what you see, but get a broad picture. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields because Isaiah prophesied that of the increase of his peace and government, there would be no end. That means today the kingdom's as small as it'll ever be because tomorrow it's going to be a little bigger. You know how many people by actual statistic, by those who keep them, are getting saved every week in the world right now? 
500,000 people are coming to faith every week right now around the world, primarily <laughs> Brazil, primarily Brazil, parts of Asia, China, and the United States. 500,000 a week. That means that on the current trajectory, this will be the first millennium in history since Jesus came that over a billion people come to faith in one millennium. Better than it's ever been. The great Reinhard Bonnke, the evangelist who went to heaven, was a dear friend of, my, of mine, of ours. Uh, he had a crusade in Nigeria with eight million people that attended in less than two weeks and a million saved in one night. There was never a crusade held like that two or 300 years ago. Never happened. It's better. It's bigger. Don't get your eyes on the darkness. The devil is a liar and still lying. What would I do and what would I tell you if I wanted you to quit? Would I fill you full of glorious information about how many people are coming to faith? Would I tell you about the greatest churches in the world being, listen, you can go to places, that, uh, churches I've been to in other countries of the world that are so, such a blessing and so challenging. I went to one church in Africa where they have more than a million members and they have like 100,000 intercessors, but their double job, because the, uh, the church building is over a mile long, the, the covered seat, the roof of it, I, I spoke there. It's over a mile long, and the 100,000 or so intercessors, they also double as janitors and keepers of the property. And so 24-7, there are thousands. I went out there like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, I didn't go out there just to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning. I was one of the special speakers, and they put me on at 1 a.m. Because at their conference, they had church day and night. I was speaking at 11 a.m., and 1 a.m. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, I made it through that. <laughs> Better than it's ever been. Yeah. Lift up your eyes. Get that darkness off of you. Shake yourself. Say, the kingdom of God is powerful. I'm going to be filled with joy. So he says, see. Then he says, consider. He calls us to think. How do they grow? They don't dress themselves, but God cares for them. Ladies, all the ladies now say amen. amen. I'm going to give you a new hero right now. A lady named Juliana of Norwich in England in the 15th century was what the church in those days called an anchorist. We would call them prayer warriors now. An anchorist was a single woman, could be a man, usually women, who built a little one-room house. The church would help them, and they built it adjoining the building of the church. And they dedicated their life to living in that one room, praying and fasting and writing and seeking God and lifting up their city. And Juliana of Norwich did that for years. She's also distinguished. You should study her. And for you women of God, she should be a hero to you because she is the oldest known record we have of a woman in the body of Christ being a prolific and published writer. When she passed, all of her writings were published, and out of them, she wrote in one of her books, and I, it's just a short story that I'll tell you, but this is the way she wrote it. She wrote this, and in this, she was praying about her future and, and things that we worry about, and she says, and in this, he showed me a little thing, the quantity of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand, as it seemed, and it was as round as any ball. I looked upon it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what may this become? And it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. I marveled how it might last, for I thought it might suddenly have fallen to nothing for littleness. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasts and ever shall. For God loves it, God made it, and God cares for it. And that I do for you as well. As simple as that is, look at the power of that. What God says to us is, listen, whatever you're worried about, cast your care on me. I made you. I love you. And I'll care for you. You got nothing to worry about. 
if you get that, you will be so filled with real happiness. It'll change your life. The firm in New York working with us, they told me the first day that we were going to hire them, we're secular Jews and we don't know anything about God. But we like your book and we believe in its potential and it really flips the script on God and, and his care for us and how he wants to help us. So let's go. So long story short, we ended up signing a, an agreement with them and they have been wonderful to work with and God is changing their life. They have been really moved by this book. But I told, uh, I think the Ballards I was speaking with last night, this was such a blessing to me because I said to one of the ladies, name is Vela, and she's in charge of the development of some of the message for the coaching content. And I said, Vela, I really want your contemporary look at this. And she said, okay. So I said, she said, how so? And I said, okay, this was early on. I said, okay, let me ask you as a secular person that you've said, I don't know much about God. What do you do with the beatitude where Jesus said, happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake? What do you do with that? She said, that's the easiest one of all. I said, how so? She said, Pastor Mike, think of all the single moms who did the right thing and stayed in that marriage and the man left them with two or three children and they're persecuted for doing the right thing. Think about those on a job who wouldn't be crooked or lie and got laid off and lied on. They were persecuted for doing the right thing. That's one of the most common ills there is in our society. People who are suffering undeservedly. What about those who are living peacefully in Ukraine and then Russia comes from the north and destroys everything that they've known as a normal life? They're suffering for a right cause. Just trying to do the right thing. Didn't ask for what they got. What about those in southern Israel living in kibbutz peacefully and then they're attacked by terrorists? and murdered viciously, suffering for doing the right thing. Not doing wrong, not criminals. So the Beatitudes Jesus taught are so practical for our world today that we have every reason to believe that we can be filled with joy and happiness in spite of what the world puts out. Would you stand with me for a moment? And uh, I wanna finish this today with a blessing for you. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9, <clears throat> I'd like to apply because in the book Real Happy, we talk about the gospel of the poppy. The good news that it preaches to all of God's creatures, we lay out nine happy messages that the little poppy proclaims throughout the Beatitudes. Hebrews 1 and 9 says, you have loved righteousness. Let this speak to you out of the word. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Of all the things God wants to cover you with, for you overcoming, God has set you above your companions. Think about your competitors in a business. Think about those in the office that are jealous and don't tell the truth about you. Think about those. God will set you above all of that and anoint you with the oil of joy. That's what I want to pray for you right now. I want to know how many of you will receive the oil of joy because he wants to anoint you with that right now. And he wants to set you above every trial that has made you anxious. Father, in Jesus' name right now, every precious man, woman, and young person whose hands are outstretched, I pray that you anoint us, Father, with the oil of joy. Lord, I pray that we resign from trying to be personally good enough and holy enough to impress you with our holiness. Because if we did, we would be self-righteous and it would have been a waste for Jesus to come and suffer and bleed and die if we could be good on our own. We couldn't and we can't. We receive the baptism of joy right now. Father, we make a pledge that our new lifestyle is going to be the first words in our mind are going to be consider the poppy. Every time there is a worry presented at the doorstep of our mind, we're going to say to it, consider the poppy. He doesn't labor or toil, but God cares for him. Solomon's never been dressed greater. Look at him. So let our pledge be from this day forward, consider the poppy. See what God has done. God made me. God loves me. And God will care for me. 
Father, right now in Jesus' name, we galal, we galal everything that makes us anxious. Look at me for just a moment. There's a verse of scripture that, that the Spirit of God brings to me right now that I rely heavily on a lot of times. This week I did with my sister. And the scripture translates this, this way. Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. In Hebrew, the word cast your cares is the word galal. And galal comes from, of all things, people who handled camels. They were camel drivers. The camels of Jesus' world were like the 18-wheelers. They hauled all the freight. Galal was a command. They would, the camel drivers would take them by the uh, reins. When they had come across the desert, burning sand, and they had a huge load of packages and boxes and freight on their back. When they would get to the gates of the city, the gates were too small for a loaded camel to come through. So the driver would say in Hebrew, Galal. And he would get down on his knees and under the command of Galal, he would roll over on his side and expose his belly and the owner of the camel would undo the leather belts on the bottom that held his apparatus on that carried all that load and then he would take his reins get him back up and the camel would stand up and all the freight was laying on the ground and that's called galal and in that verse god literally says galal all your cares on me because i care for you just get down and roll over and unbuckle that strap and stand up free of that stuff. In Jesus' name, be free. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, be free. Yes. 